when we start talking about, you know, the way a child behaves when they have behavior problems, it often stems back to, uh, you know, they're just not sleeping well, they're not resting ever. Welcome to Talking About Kids. I am your host, R. Bradley Snyder, researcher, activist, and author of The Five Simple Truths of Raising Kids. Kids need sleep. Adequate sleep helps prevent type 2 diabetes, obesity, mental health problems, and even injury. My guest today, Blaine Leeds, and his colleagues believe that Apnea is to blame for many kids' sleep issues. Blaine is a dentist, an innovator, the author of What Happens When Your Child Doesn't Sleep, and a passionate advocate. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Arizona Department of Health Services' Must Stop Bullying campaign through its Title V Maternal and Child Health Program. For more information, go to muststopbullying.org. And now, the interview. What got me interested was I became a patient myself. I had uh, sleep apnea and didn't know it. And my wife, um, who was a very heavy sleeper, I like to call her a professional sleeper. She's probably asleep now somewhere. Uh, actually she's not, I know exactly where she is, but, uh, she sleeps well and deeply. And so for her to hear me struggling to breathe, Mm. uh, in the night was a concern. I mean, she, and she, you know, the sounds I was making awakened her from her sleep. And so I went through the standard medical process, just like many parents and kids have out there. And I went to a, you know, a sleep center and I went to my family doctor and, and I ended up getting a CPAP machine. And luckily, one of the RNs who worked in the sleep center said, oh, don't even mess with these other attachments. You need a nasal pillow attachment. Um, and I, I got one of those from the beginning. And I had a little bit of soreness on, my, on the tip of my nose, you know, like most people do when you start using the appliance and using the device. But I've had a good experience with it. Um, I slept four and a half hours the first night I wore the device. It took me about 20 seconds to put the apparatus on less time than it took to put a baseball cap on pretty much or same amount of time. And I slept four and a half hours, felt like I'd been asleep for a month. I woke, I mean, and you know how it is when you get a great night's sleep, you feel fabulous. And I just didn't realize it was so subtle. I, I, and I had been someone, uh, you know, who had not required a lot of sleep. Uh, I could go till late into the night and get up early in the morning. And, but I was always a very light sleeper. In other words, if something awakened me, then I had trouble going back to sleep, you know, in the middle of the night. So, um, and that's a sign actually of, of sleep apnea mm-hmm. too. When, when you can, when you wake up and you can't go back to sleep or you, everything wakes you up, you know, it's, uh, when you're not getting to deep levels of sleep, people end up waking up more often. So that's how I got interested. And then I realized that, you know, I could take a whole new approach in my physical dental practice. We could start talking to these hygiene patients that we see, uh, you know, a lot of people call it cleaning their teeth. You know, you clean your teeth at home with a toothbrush and floss. What you get from a hygienist is so much better. It's so much more further advanced than that, that I, my, all my hygiene friends remind me that I do a good job. I'm not calling it a cleaning, you know, we call it dental hygiene because uh, these gals are so uh, super important to what we do and guys, lots of guys out there that are hygienists too. Um, but, you know, they're the periodontists of our office. And so when we see these patients, twice a year, you know, it's a nice increment every six months or so, sometimes more often than that, sometimes less often than that. We get to see these medical changes that happen in people. You might have a patient that loses 45 pounds. You might have somebody who had a heart cath last Monday, and uh, now they're in your office today. Uh, So, you know, it reminds you when you have sleep apnea, you start to see all these signs and symptoms in a patient, you know, the the wear on the teeth, the, Mm. the penis pooling under the eyes, the big sacks under their eyes from someone who's not resting well. And so I started asking my patients, you know, how, uh, how are you sleeping? And they looked at me with a funny look and what do you care? You're the dentist, you know, and, and we would have that discussion, but eventually, um, you know, I, I started working more in telehealth and doing remote, uh, orthodontics. And, and I was like, look, why, 
why do we have to limit this to just orthodontics? Let's let's look at orthodontic appliances for children. And then uh, I did a lot of training in sleep and uh, obstructed you know, sleep apnea and sleep obstructed breathing. And I started working with companies who did a lot of education with doctors and dentists and teams. And we realized, oh, wow, we've got these kids that we can, we have an appliance that we can help them develop their jaws. And it has all these wonderful positive effects on the way that they sleep and breathe. And so that's kind of the tie in how I got interested. I mean, I guess to me, it seems like kind of a big jump actually from thinking about, you know, apnea in adults to recognizing that there might be something going on with jaw development. I I don't want to jump too far ahead because I think this is one of the more interesting um, parts of your story, but just to paint the picture, what makes sleep so important, especially to kids? Well, it's, it's just vastly important to their growth and development, the growth of their, their skeletal bones, their brain, their, their, the way that their heart functions. Uh, it, it's just really important that we have that restorative downtime for kids. And we know that y- the younger a child is, and depending on what stage of development they are, the more sleep that they might require. Um, and so it's, it's just really important for a lot of body systems, especially the health of your brain, you know? And so when we start talking about, you know, the way a child behaves when they have behavior problems, it often stems back to, uh, they, you know, they're just not sleeping well. They're not resting right. ever. Right. And, and in fact, in your book, which I'll mention off the top of the bat here is what happens when your child doesn't sleep. Um, you break it down. You, you look at not only the, the mental health aspects of it, which is something talking about kids, listeners will be familiar with, cause we've talked about this before, but you also talk about, you know, the restorative, that, that sleep is restorative to cells, um, that it helps us with our immune system. So you, you kind of start off your book giving us a laundry list about why we should be concerned that our, our kids are getting enough sleep. And I get that. And I get that, you know, and I also get that apnea is important in adults. But then you start talking about jaw development. So how did you, again, when did you first recognize that, that there was something happening with some of your patients and how their jaws were developing? Well, for me, it was about seven years ago now, in 2017. Uh, I, I did some really interesting continuing education work uh, with a doctor and now business partner of mine, Dr. Ben Moralia. Ben is from uh, Mount Kisco, New York. And Ben has been treating kids with with underdeveloped jaws for over 20 years. Uh, And he started to see uh, that, you know, most of us have had a friend or relative or even in ourselves, we've had braces. Well, you can probably remember when you were a kid, maybe one kid on your block had braces, you know, or a couple did. But but now it's like seven in 10 kids or eight or eight or nine out of 10 kids have to have orthodontics. Well, in dental school, we're taught, you know, wait till all the the you know, the primary teeth, the baby teeth exfoliate, and then it's time to go to the orthodontist around age 10 or 12. But, you know, that doesn't address uh, the the issues of crowding that these kids have in the mixed dentition phase and when they have primary teeth only. And of course, by the time a child is two years of age, they have their full set of, of baby teeth or primary teeth, which are a, a number, number in 20 in total, 20 total teeth. And, and so, we noticed that there was a correlation between, because when you're, when your molars, when a patient, even a child, when their molars are too close together, their upper molars, that the palate arches. Mm. And so you have, when the, when the jaws are crowded, the palate becomes vaulted and the palate needs to be flat and broad. So there's room for the tongue. And so if there's no room for the tongue to fit up behind the baby incisors, these kids start to breathe, have breathing problems and they begin breathing through their mouth because they their airway space, which is the area above the palate, a triangular shaped space in the skull. Right. When the molars are too close together and there's immense crowding and there's underdeveloped jaws, then we have this arched palate and therefore uh, patients, children can't breathe through their nose and humans wow. are obligate nasal breathers. We should be breathing through our nose quietly, effortlessly, invisibly all the time. And when, when a child is breathing through their mouth, then they're, they're not filtering the air. The nose is, uh, you know, you get my profile here. The nose is way up off of our face, right? right? 
So it heats the air to temperature, you know, to warm it up. So you're not getting stark cold air. When a patient is mouth breathing, they're breathing that stark cold air right into the oral cavity, right back to the back of the throat, right to the tonsils. And so it creates tonsillitis, inflammation of the tonsils. Wow. If a child has to mouth breathe, the other key feature is when we breathe through our noses, it's the only time in our body's anatomy and physiology when there's a little sensor back by the parasinuses that creates a chemical called nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. So in other words, it loosens up the vasculature, right? So we have oh. all the, our blood vessels expand and then oxygenated blood gets to the brain which helps with sleep. It gets to all the muscles and the developing heart and all of the important organs in our body. And that only occurs through nasal breathing. So the crowding, the underdeveloped jaws hampers nasal breathing by shrinking the air, what we call the airway space. And so uh, that, that's the connection. That had to be, I mean, that had to be quite the aha moment when you put that together especially given your own history That's and cool. knowing what uh, and how important good sleep can be to young people. Sure. Well, Let's, and the co-author of my book, Brian yeah. Ferry, you know, he, he, um, he lost his wife to complications of sleep apnea and she was treated for everything else under the sun. She was on all kinds of heavy pharmaceuticals and trying to help her sleep and trying to help her with depression and anxiety and other things that happen when a patient doesn't sleep. Uh, for prolonged periods of time. It just changes our body and our brain chemistry. Uh, and so, yeah, it was an aha moment. It was like, uh, you know, how embarrassing really that I didn't know this, that for, for 19, 22 years I'd been in practice uh, and and nobody had ever shared this information with me. And so it was like, man, I've been letting my patients down. I got to get back and, and share this information with people. And that's, that's why I'm talking to you today. So that hopefully you know, even if it's four, five, six hundred thousand, ten thousand people at a time that listen to these podcasts, maybe maybe one starfish out there, right, right. will get tossed back in the ocean. It'll make a difference to them, right? Well, one of the things that has me, I mean, again, why I was so excited to talk to you about this is, you know, I'm when we look at all of the diagnoses that kids have, from ADHD to autism spectrum disorder, the whole gamut. <clears throat> All of those diagnoses are contingent on two things, or they're supposed to be given the DSM. They're supposed to be, you're, you're supposed to ensure that the patient, the child, is getting adequate sleep and adequate nutrition. So those are two things that you're supposed to be able to ensure before you can make those diagnoses. Now, you and I and my listeners know that doesn't happen, right? You know, we, that, this isn't actually how we work with kids. So it's kind of up to all of us to do the best that we can to help our kids get as much sleep as they can and get the right nutrition. Um, so th that's one of the things that got me so excited about this. When you, and, and I want to get into the, the treatment of this here in a second, but I know that I have, my listeners are primarily parents and, and teachers, a lot of teachers. What are some of the warning signs that they should look for? And we're, we're not going to, force them to diagnose apnea. But what are some of the things they should be looking at in their kids that suggest, hey, this kid is not getting enough sleep? Sure. Um, well, we, we say in our, our world, you can't unsee it, right? Once you learn what the signs and symptoms are, then you're overwhelmed because you sit in an airport terminal and you go, that kid's got it, that kid's got it. I mean, literally, you can see from across, you know, 30 feet away, you can right. tell. Um, but what, what are the obvious signs, okay? Uh, are they tired all the time? Are they irritable at school? Do they have trouble waking up to get ready to go to school? I've had some parents tell me, uh, my kid sleeps great. I can't even wake them up in the morning. Well, that's actually a problem because ah. if they're in a deep sleep at 6, 6.30 a.m., then how long have they been trying to get to that point all night? So, you know, sometimes even heavy sleep early in the morning when you're trying to get a child awake is a sign. Um, but irritable behavior, lack of attention span. Uh, then we look at the physical signs and symptoms, crowded teeth. Uh, when you look at a child's profile, underdeveloped mandible. So, you know, we have a crowded upper arch. Right. So the mandible becomes constricted and it, and it constricts the growth of the mandible because the teeth are, are, are together. And then when the, when they, when the teeth bite together, then they then it locks the mandible in place when the teeth are closed. Okay. 
And so it restricts mandibular growth. And so a, 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 a reduced mandibular profile with, with a, a lack of a prominent chin. Uh, drooling, drooling is a common sign. Oh, wow. Like, I, I mean, that was one parent's chief complaint. She had her three-year-old child. She said, I, I cannot get Charlie to stop drooling. And, and she'd been to five ear, nose and throat specialists. They removed this child's tonsils and adenoids at age three. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he looked 71 years old, this kid, and he was oh. three. I mean, it re- retreated mandible, deep, dark circles under the eyes, oh. which is another sign and symptom is what we call venous pooling. And this poor little guy, the reason that he was drooling all the time was because he couldn't breathe through his nose at all. Right. So he was constantly breathing through his mouth. And, you know, kids are great at making saliva. You make a ton of it, right? Which is really helpful to them as it keeps plaque from building up and, it, and it's part of their development. But when, you know, and basically if he's got a retreated mandible and he's trying to breathe, he's got his head forward a little bit, which is another sign and symptom. In other words, if you, if you look at a child and they're standing profile in the doorway and their head's leaning out over you like a tortoise, okay. you know, leaning out over their spine, they're doing that because they're, they're trying to breathe. They're, uh. they're, they're putting their head forward so they can draw breath through their nose, or excuse me, through their mouth right. because they can't breathe through their nose. And so, um, but this child, he was drooling all the time because he, he couldn't swallow his, all of his saliva because when he did, he had to stop breathing to do it. And so, you know, and all he really needs is a, is an appliance, you know, that he can sleep in at nighttime that will help. It's a removable appliance that he can wear that will expand his jaws and it'll help him. And we, and we see this, this happen a lot, but uh, frequent allergies is also okay. a sign and symptom if the child's always sick. Um, you know, they have frequent allergies or because uh, they're not filtering through their nose breathing, right? Because they're, th- correct, they're taking all correct. that. In. Okay. And they have, mm-hmm, yep. And they're not, uh, they're not getting to breathe, getting good nasal breathing. Yep. And so you started to talk a little bit about the solution there. Um, it, and the solution you've mentioned so far is this appliance that helps kids with this symptom, with these symptoms breathe at night. Tell me a little bit about this appliance. Sure. This is a, uh, a flexible appliance. It's a removable appliance. Um, the company that I'm an advisor for, there's several of them on the market that will work. Um, the company that, that I work with is a company called Tooth Pillow. So if there are patients and parents online, you can have treatment from me if I'm, I'm licensed in 12 states, you know, and, and you don't have to come see me if you live in, you know, if you live in Illinois and I happen to be in Utah at the time or whatever, you don't right. have to physically drive. This can be done through telehealth and the parents go on and fill out a survey and then they also upload some photographs. And that's really all that we need to diagnose this. And the appliance is just think of it as replacing the Wooby, if you will, okay. when you're two years old. You, you let the child put this in. And, and many times the first thing that any of my little patients do is if I hand them something and they're two or three years old, they put it in their mouth. Right. It's the first thing they do. So, and it works with this appliance. It's pretty intuitive. Most of them will just put it in their mouth. And I don't, I don't even insert most of them. I let the child insert the, the appliance, but sometimes they'll have it upside down. We have to flip it over, but it's a flexible appliance that basically does one thing. And that is keep the muscles of the cheeks off, off the, the baby posterior teeth. Okay. And also create, keep a, a barrier between uh, the gums and the airway space and the tongue so that the tongue can can begin to start fitting up in the palate where it belongs, because the tongue is our own, our body's own natural expander of the palate. Okay. And so basically this, these appliances will, will guide the patient to put their tongue in the proper place. In fact, the very first one that we, we provide to the kids has a little tongue training device where we have them during waking hours. We like them to wear it an hour or so at night before bed during screen time or when they're doing homework or watching TV or something. And, and then they sleep in it overnight okay. and really, and, and some kids take to it right away. Some kids, uh, they they have to scale up and they wear it for 15, 20 minutes a night. Our mom and dad will find it on the pillow at some point. But what we found is that even a small amount every day is better than not at all. And they can wear the appliance. but eventually most of these kids get comfortable sleeping in it all night because once the human body learns to, to breathe nasally during sleep, you feel so much better that it's just, it's conditional. You're just going to wear the appliance because it feels better and you're feeling better and the kids are feeling better and they're, they're performing better at school and, and, you know, breathing better. And, it, and so, 
and in fact, we've even seen it help children who, who are bedwetting mm. uh, because uh, bedwetting is tied to oxygen levels in the body. And when our body becomes oxygen deprived, and we're not getting oxygen to the brain, it starts to signal our other organ systems to do things to release oxygen into the blood. And one of those is to, is to flush the kidneys and filter, get filtered uh, oxygenated blood back in the system. And so the, the kidneys will flush and that's why kids are, are bedwetting. And so in many times, of course, right. there's other causes of bedwetting, but this is a, one of the central ones. And so when we have, like if I hand 10 kids a tooth pillow who are bedwetting every night, seven of them will stop that night. Wow. I mean, it's pretty dramatic. Um, I, I hate that. And I, I don't mean to, to catch you off guard with this next question. I really don't. But is, is this appliance something that's typically covered by insurance or is this something that parents are having to do out of pocket? You know, I think it I almost always would be covered okay. uh, w- with an orthodontic rider on dental insurance. Okay. What we try to do is I, um, many, most of the insurances that I've been working with, they cover orthodontics uh, at, a, at about $1,500 of annual maximum benefit right. toward orthodontics. And so what we do is we try to make it affordable for the patient so that they can save those orthodontic benefits in case they need to put it toward full on braces or okay. clear aliners or something later on. Yeah. But, I'm just, uh, and that's, another, go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, I was going to say that, and that's another uh, byproduct of this treatment by starting early and expanding the palate, the teeth start to have room to come in. So when we expand the palate, the mandible follows suit and now we have enough room you know, for, for all the teeth. So right. it really helps make orthodontics either easier or sometimes not even necessary for these kids. So you're, you're, it sounds like you're advocating for recognizing this as early as possible in the kids in your life, right? This isn't, Absolutely. you know, we, when we were talking about behavior problems and, and some of those other sleep issues, we're definitely talking about older kids, but it seems like to have the greatest benefit, you want to be looking for this in kids at, at, like two, three? I mean, you mentioned full set of teeth at two. That's right. That's right. And uh, I used to tell parents, you know, if you don't see any obvious problems with your child's pediatric dentition, their baby teeth, you know, if you don't see any holes in teeth or dark darkness on any of it, it's okay to wait till they're four or five to come to the dentist. And boy, was I wrong about that. You know, once I learned about airway right. and sleep and, and breathing, you know, now we, we ask for families to bring their kids into the dentist when they're one and a half, two years old. And even if they just see that it's a happy place and it's not scary, you know, and they're there for five minutes and they come back later, that's fine. Uh, you know, we can give mom some home care instructions, some hygiene instructions for home. But this is another sign and symptom or uh, in kids before uh, that are have the age that are before school age, for example. If if we look in the, I used to have moms and dads say, look at, look at Timmy's teeth. They're so straight and they're all just nicely jammed together and they look so beautiful. Well, if that happens at age two, that's actually crowding to us in the dental world because ideal primary dentition should have about the width of a U.S. 10 cent coin, a dime in between each tooth all the way around the arch. That's so that's normal or natural dentition. And I'm telling you, if I go to a pediatric dental office that sees 400 hygiene kids a week, I might see 10 Right. that have perfect primary dentition because we're four generations into this. Uh, and one, one thing we haven't really talked about is what caused all this? Well, soft diet, uh, mom's not breastfeeding for as long, the old good old American way where mom and dad are both working yeah. and mom works second shift and dad works day shift and they never see each other. And, and moms can't take the right amount of maternity leave and they can't breastfeed their child till they're three or four or five years old, which they do in sub-Saharan Africa. And guess what? We see less than 5% incidence of sleep apnea in sub-Saharan Africa. So it, it's really important that we catch this early and, and, you know, we, and we watch the soft diet. You know, that, as long as we can keep a child from choking, they need to be biting on okay. a carrot or something where they can, you know, they're exercising their gums and they're expanding the arch by chewing because we now know that breastfeeding uh, in an infant is more of a chewing motion than okay. it is a suckling motion. And so... Uh, you know, there's some companies out there that are trying to design better pacifiers and to help with this. But, you know, it's it's a we're four generations into lots of crowded teeth. So, yeah, we need to start early. And so wow. if you see a, a little kiddo that's that's got 
especially if they have crowded teeth, crowded baby teeth, then, then they're already having issues. So, and also we, we have to do a better job in my profession in the pediatric medical world too, of diagnosing tongue ties and lip ties, because if a patient has a tongue tie, what we call ankyloglossia in our world, they'll literally, literally have a little piece of connective tissue right. on the tip of the tongue that, that just some, for some reason didn't develop and they physically can't lift their tongue. So their tongue will by definition never be in the palate. Right. And I've, I've even had dental colleagues. I've got one dental colleague whose parents were both dentists. And this dentist realized they had a tongue tie yeah. in their thirties as a practitioner and that had never been diagnosed. So, you know, as a, right. in the dental world, in the medical world, and also we have what we call lip ties where the, where the connective tissue, uh, what we call the frenum, the connective tissue that connects the lip to the mucosa or the lip to the gums is many times uh, too vigorous or, or the lip is tied down so that the child can't, can't move their lips properly. And so that can cause uh, issues with, with breathing as well. How accepted, so you mentioned that you have a colleague who's 30 without realizing the tongue tie, um, the crowding of the teeth, the arching of the palate, uh, these devices. Um, is this something that, that pediatric dentists are accepting, they're, they're recognizing, or if a listener goes into his or her dentist, are, are they going to have to educate their dentist about this? Well, I wish I could say that every single practitioner knows about this, but I was at the Academy, American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine meeting in Philadelphia in May. I had not been a member of that organization before. I joined at that meeting. One of my colleagues, Dr. Barry Chase, I'll give him a plug. So if you're in the, in the New York area, Dr. Barry Chase is like the godfather of dental sleep medicine in, in New York. He's got nine locations. He's been doing it for 40 years. He's wow. brilliant. Uh, and he and I were at the meeting together. Uh, and I was doing some, some work with him, which is a, a lifelong uh, goal of mine to get to spend a lot of time with him and learn from him, which I did back in May. But I, I, and I went to that meeting th and I'd been kind of immersed in this, you know, sleep apnea, dental sleep space world for working exclusively almost in that and Clarion Orthodontics for the past year before going to this meeting thinking, okay, we're going to, here we go. We're going to get into this really. And, you know, it was really uh, surprising to me how far we still have to go. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're talking today is because right. my goal is to get out there and share this story because there's a diagnostic chasm between medicine and dentistry and in, in, in medicine, you know, we're going to treat symptoms with a machine, right? We're going to put right. somebody on a CPAP machine. There was a medical doctor, a researcher at the meeting who was a speaker. Okay. Now this is the number one dental sleep medicine organization in the United States, in the world. Actually, there were speakers there from Scotland and Australia and all over the world. But this, this woman was describing a study of seven children. Okay. I treated seven children yesterday. Yeah. All right. She had done a, a, a study of seven children. And basically they determined that really maybe sleep apnea doesn't exist in children. It, it's probably something that they're going to grow out of. Right. Uh, there was a time when there wasn't even a medical code for children's sleep apnea. Right. And so as we know in Western medicine, if we don't have an insurance code for it, it must not exist. So, you know, uh, here we are uh, at this meeting with these lauded professionals who are there. And I'm telling you, there was still some really confusing stuff coming from the podium based on what I'm seeing out there in, in the brick and mortar world where we're treating these patients. And so the answer is we've got a long way to go. And so, it, it, there's a, probably a 90% chance that your, your pediatric dentist or your, your general dentist who can be really good at what they do still, still may not know about this or still may not know the signs and symptoms and how to look for it. Now, your book is directed at, at consumers. So this is a book for, for parents and teachers. What resource do you recommend parents and teachers and direct service providers point their dentist to? What mm -hmm. research should they be bringing with them if they're going to advocate for their kids? Well, I, I would start by, you know, where everybody starts, right? YouTube. Okay. And if you go to YouTube and you put in Dr. Ben Moralia or Dr. Callie Hale, and you can put these people's names in the show notes. Yep. These are my 
These are two of my colleagues, Dr. Kevin Goals in Colorado, Dr. Barry Chase in New York, Manhattan, Got Long it. Island. Uh, these people, you, uh, uh, there's a wonderful, and I'm going to miss her first name. It's either Kathleen or Catherine Carson, Dr. Carson in California. She has a TED Talk okay. on, on YouTube that people can watch. And she is trained with the same background that I am. And she's a fabulous dentist. There's Dr. Liz Turner in Colorado. And Dr. Liz is a specialist on lactation and nursing and early uh, childhood development. She's fabulous. So there are some good resources there. And if you just go into YouTube and put in these people's names, you'll start to, to go down that algorithm rabbit hole where right. you find a lot of this good information about what we're dealing with. Well, I, I want to thank you so much for, you know, agreeing to come on talking about kids. Um, like I said, I, I really enjoyed your book. I suspect you had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, the way I was, when I was reading it, I, there was an excitement to it. Um, and given that it's about, you know, sleep and apnea in kids and, you know, mandible development, all that kind of stuff, um, it, it was, it was enjoyable and there was an energy to it. Did, did you have fun writing it? Cause it seemed like you might have. Yeah, well, I had fun because I'm working with my brother, right? Brian Ferry's okay. like my brother from another mother. When we met, we were, um, I had heard a podcast that he was on discussing his wife's situation and, and her tragic passing. And it was a dental podcast uh, with another colleague of mine uh, named Gary Takis, who's a great teacher and lecturer in the dental world. And I was like, I got to meet this guy. And uh Come to find out one of the training meetings that I was going to, he was actually going to be a presenter. And so someone had put us in contact with one another and we happened to be at the same hotel and Brian was on his cell phone talking to me. And then he started to hear me in his left ear as well. And so he turned and he said, are you in Denver? And I said, yeah. And he, and he said, are you at the Marriott or wherever we were? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, I'm on the back porch. Where are you? And I was about 30 feet behind you. So this is how we met. And so it's been just like that the whole time. And so we, there is a very fun, Brian's a hilarious guy, very funny background in marketing. He's worked with companies like Intel and, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and built, he built their website back in 1996, one of the first websites ever built. Uh, he, he's been around the marketing business for a long time, but he was working in marketing because he was so passionate. Uh, about sleep apnea and, and, and how he's like, how did I not know about this? I'm right. not a fairly intelligent guy. I know my wife was dying of something and I didn't know what it was. Right. And so he was on this crusade basically to, you know, nobody else needs to die, but because of this, we need to, I've got to get out there and tell people about this. But Brian's a very passionate and funny guy. And, and I'll give credit where credit's due. He wrote most of the first chapter. So if you like that first chapter, hopefully my, I won't get too technical with it, but that's one of the things that I feel like is one of my gifts is I was always able to talk to my right. patients in a way they could understand. And I, that's what we want to do with this book. We want to tell the story in a way that, that is it engaging? Is it fun? Right. And I wanted it to be at, written at a, at my education level, which is an attention span, which is about fourth grade <laughs> level. So if you, if you, it ought to be something that, you know, if, if it's boring you, that's okay. Come back and spend 15 minutes with it in another chapter at some point. But, but the idea is to get, you know, to get the word out here and tell a new story about right. dentistry and about what we're trying to do. Well, I, what I can tell you is that I do believe that this is going to be um, another tool in the tool belt of my listeners as they go about making um, the the life for the kids uh, better. So thank you so much for doing it. And again, thank you for being a guest. Well, it's my pleasure, Brad. Thanks for having me. That was Blaine Leeds. For more information about Blaine, his research, and his book, please visit our website, talkingaboutkids.com. From there, you also can find out about upcoming episodes, suggest a topic, learn more about me and my books, or submit your questions for future guests. Our theme song is by The Senators. For more of their music, go to thesenatorsmusic.com. And remember... Kids are young goats and young humans, and the difference is that young goats are easier to manage. <laughs>